you've probably all seen those commercials um, where the little sad blobby thing, you know, is is, is kind of hopping around on the screen, and they're talking in the commercial. They're talking about depression, and there's like cartoon rain and this cartoon blob that just hops around. And that commercial is for SSRI medication. So what I'm drawing you here is this is a nerve ending. So this is like think of this. It's all it's called a synaptic. Uh, Bhutan, but but let's just call it a nerve ending. That's easier language for most folks. And so what happens is the nerve, the electrical impulse of the nerve is traveling this way, and this is the end or the tip of the nerve. And then what generally happens is that nerve, there's another nerve ending where this nerve can talk to this nerve. And so what happens is inside the tip of the nerve, you have all these little what are called vesicles. And inside these vesicles, um, we've got these little chemicals called neurotransmitters and these neurotransmitters in this case we're, we're going to call these serotonin so we're going to say this is a nerve ending and the primary chemical in the nerve is serotonin and so what happens is when the nerve message depolarizes or the electrical impulse hits these um, these little these little areas there's a gate right here it's called a calcium channel so any of you on calcium channel blockers, pay close attention. This calcium channel, you've got calcium, free-floating calcium floating around out here. And so what happens is when this, let me change my color again, when this nerve impulse hits this gate, it opens it. So it's, a, it's an electrical gate. It's, a, it's, it's like your garage door opener. If you click the button, right, the door opens. Well, this nerve impulse opens this gate and calcium floods into the cell or the tip of this nerve ending, and it tells these little vesicles, these little bubbles that are full of serotonin, it tells them, so let's just put serotonin here so you guys can follow me, it, it, it tells these guys to dump the serotonin in the middle, okay, so this serotonin, all of it kind of is dumped, these vesicles, they migrate to the edge of the cell, and they dump their serotonin into this cleft. And so on the other side, this side has little receptors so that that serotonin can hit it. And when that happens, it depolarizes this nerve and it transmits, it allows that message to continue to transmit so that this nerve can talk to that nerve. If this nerve can't talk to that nerve, that's depressed function, AKA depression. Remember, we're talking about the brain, so depressed depression can occur as a result of one nerve not being able to talk to another and it's again it's not just one nerve you've got a lot of nerve endings in your brain and in your nervous tissue but what happens is serotonin stays in this cleft stays in this space activating this other nerve and so SSRIs as a class of drug what they do is your body naturally recycles and repackages serotonin back into these vesicles. These drugs block that. And why is that important for you to understand? Is as a mechanism of action, the drugs don't increase your body's ability to make serotonin. They just preserve how long the serotonin is capable of doing its job. For many people, the problem isn't that we need our serotonin to be preserved. For many people, the problem is they have low serotonin, right? So they just don't have enough in the first place. So the drug preserves what they do have and gives them some symptomatic change, but it doesn't actually increase the level of serotonin. Now, why is that a problem? Because doctors are, they're barking up the wrong tree, in my opinion. You can't, if you're, look, you could have a tryptophan deficiency, right? If you have a tryptophan deficiency, you can't make serotonin. Remember that um, serotonin comes from tryptophan, and that comes from your diet, right? And, and ser to, to convert tryptophan to serotonin, that requires vitamin B6. So the doctor, sh sh instead of doing this first, okay, which is giving you a medication that preserves the serotonin, they should be asking a different question. Why is your serotonin, why are you behaving as if your serotonin is low? There are a number of things that can be done. Number one, they can measure your serotonin level. Number two, they can measure your tryptophan. They can measure your B6, and they can see whether or not there's a problem here. But remember, I also said that calcium plays a role in talking to these bubbles that are full of serotonin. And so if you're calcium deficient, this can also depress this process. So these, and if you're taking calcium channel blockers, this can also suppress the way that this process works. So 
you got to go deeper sometimes than just trying to attack it from kind of face value. So just wanted to share that with you because I know many of you that listen to the show are, are men and women who have been put on antidepressants because, you know, because your doctor said you have a brain imbalance. And that what I always find ironic is it's very easy to say you have a brain imbalance. What, where the complexity comes in is identifying what the brain imbalance is. Most doctors just say subjectively, oh, you have a brain imbalance, take this drug. And they don't do any homework, right? They don't do any of the deep work to try to find out what the brain imbalance is. And then so they are just using you as an experiment, right? They're saying, let's try you on this drug and see how it works. But again, this is my opinion. The field of psychiatry is very, very subjective because very few people ever get biochemical analysis. Very few people get their vitamins and minerals tested when in fact vitamins and minerals are the precursors to producing those neurochemicals that create the brain imbalance in the first place. So uh, if you're in that situation, if you're watching tonight and you find yourself where you're depressed, you're on medications, your doctor's never measured you chemically to see whether or not you even have a chemical imbalance and they're just guessing at you, hopefully this information, if you take it to them, will allow you to have uh, kind of a, a more enlightening conversation and, and uh, hopefully get you some better solutions than maybe what you're currently, uh, currently doing. Okay, so let's see here. Let's talk about grain-free food sources of vitamin B6. Let's just switch this over to a new page here. So these are some of the really good sources. Now I will just say this, your, some of your richest source of vitamin B6 is meat. So if you, but if you're on a plant-based diet, we've also got things here. So you can see salmon, turkey, chicken, grass-fed beef, shrimp, it's all meat. That's why it's on top because it's bang for bang, pound for pound, it's got the most. It's got more than these vegetables and fruits that are listed down here. That being said though, you can get B6 from spinach, cabbage, bell peppers, sweet potato, banana, winter squash, broccoli, sunflower seeds, avocado, and onions are, again, all good grain-free, you know, if we're following the no grain, no pain diet, and those of you who are listening to me should be following no grain, no pain. If you're not, you need to get the book and read it so that you can get up to speed with us. But um, these are no grain, no pain approved sources of vitamin B6. Now let's talk a little bit about supplements. So if you're interested in, in using or taking a supplemental B6, it's very, very important. There's two major types of B6 in supplements. Um, one's called pyridoxine HCL. That stands for hydrochloride, so pyridoxine hydrochloride. The other one is, is well, we'll just, we'll just call it P. 5P, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. Let's just go ahead and spell it out. Pyridoxal 5-phosphate, because sometimes it's written out on the label, and it's 5-prime phosphate. So it's a phosphorylated version of vitamin B6, which is the active form. This one is inactive, meaning your body has to then do work to activate it. This one is active. So if we're talking about the better form, pyridoxal 5-phosphate is the form you wanna look for in a supplement. Um, we got this question that came in earlier today, which is somebody was asking me what the difference between ultra-nutrients and multi-nutrients were. These are two of my uh, customized formulated B vitamin uh, and multivitamin formulas. And the biggest difference between ultranutrients and multinutrients is the quantity of B vitamins, particularly vitamin B6. There's a lot more B6 in multinutrients. We actually used to, the name used to be multineuro, and it was designed for people who were, um, who were having or suffering from the neurological consequences of gluten-induced damage. So they were more neurologically Damage. So again, I answer that. Hopefully, that person that asked that question is listening today or listening tonight. But the multinutrient formula is designed to have extra B vitamins to support neurological function, neurotransmitter production. Again, a lot of people with gluten sensitivity have these B vitamin deficiencies in a greater quantity. So it was designed to support those individuals. So multinutrients over ultranutrients, if you've got neurological problems or neurological symptoms, the B vitamin dose is just heavier to support those. But again, you're looking for pyridoxal 5-phosphate. It's, it's in terms of quantity. Um, they're, they're, they're 
depending on who you talk to, look, um, I don't recommend you go over 100 milligrams a day unless you're being monitored. If you're not being monitored, don't push it. Don't go over this. If you're being monitored, let your doctor monitor you and give you their expertise. But, you know, most supplemental preparations will contain between 1 and 25 milligrams uh, per day of, of pyridoxal 5-phosphate or pyridoxine hydrochloride. Now, this doesn't work as well, so you really want to look for this version. And again, um, 1 to 25 milligrams for most people, if you're not being monitored, should be an adequate quantity. Our, our multivitamins are a little bit higher um, than, than that, again, but the multi-nutrients for more for people that are overcoming neurological issues associated with gluten-induced malnutrition, ultranutrients doesn't have quite the level. It actually, two pills of ultranutrients has about 10 milligrams of vitamin B6, so it's a, it is a lower quantity than what you're gonna get out of the others. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below, and as always, thanks for tuning in.